Let's start off with Ukraine, Russia. When it first got started, um, you know, you were one of the ones that said this is going to be done in no time. It's almost done. It's going to be done. It's going to be done in a week. It's going to be done in a month. It's going to be done in two months. It's going to... So a lot, a lot of people felt the same way as you, but you were one of the main spokespeople that kept saying this is going to get done. Why is it still going on today and it's been as long as it's been? No, I think that's an important question. And it surprised me as well as lots of other people uh, by the... By the way, the Russians went into Ukraine. Uh, their their initial operation was very different from what anybody anticipated. And I think President Putin went in with the following objectives. Remember, he's been talking for at least 15 years about his opposition to the movement of NATO to his borders. He's made it very clear that he regarded it as a threat. One of the reasons he moved into Crimea was that he saw that becoming a NATO naval base, principally for the U.S. Navy, obviously in the Black Sea. So he moved on that first and then said, look, I, th it's got to stop. Well, what happened, of course, as you know, is we had the coup in Kiev, or now the Ukrainians call it Kiev. And as a result, we installed a, a government that was prepared to do essentially whatever we wanted them to do. And uh, we poured billions of dollars in very early to build up an enormous Ukrainian military force whose sole objective was to attack Russia. And it wasn't very long before Putin concluded that if I don't act soon, I'll have missiles sitting on my border that will be able to reach my uh, nuclear deterrent in no time and rob Russia of any sort of security at all. So he decides to go in, but I think he thought at the beginning, and this was a false assumption, that he would have someone to negotiate with. So he said, I'm going to go in really initially with only about 90,000 troops organized into small contingents he gave strict orders that they were to avoid collateral damage at all costs, didn't want to kill anybody. He knew he was moving into an area which was largely Russian anyway. But he also didn't want to kill Ukrainian forces at that point. He said, I'm, I want to demilitarize the place, but he said, I don't want unnecessary casualties on the Ukrainian side. And remember, from his vantage point, these were also Slavic cousins, brothers, whatever you want to call them. And the Russians felt that way, I think, initially. And so he moves in with this very small force. He encounters a lot of resistance. I think the resistance is exaggerated in the sense that the Russians have never taken heavy casualties. But nevertheless, he encountered a great deal of resistance. But most important, when he met with people for negotiations, he discovered there, there's no willingness to reach an agreement because Washington principally is in charge. Washington doesn't want an agreement. I mean, he can read the tea leaves and the tea leaves are very clear. This is Washington's opportunity to, quote unquote, bleed Russia. Uh, in addition to bleeding Russia, once we bled it, we're going to see Putin and his regime removed. And ultimately, then we'll think about what we want to do with Russia to include stripping it of resources, breaking it up into smaller parts, whatever. This, of course, was a horror story that he had not really believed in. And he found out, gee, I, I was wrong. And so by the summer, he has a meeting with all the senior officers, and they say, look, we, we wanted to go in hard. You told us to go in soft. We wanted more troops. You said no. Now we're in the middle of something. We're not going to end this conclusively unless we build a larger and more decisive force with the right capabilities. And so you have this change in strategy. It says we will consolidate control over what we've got, which is about 20 to 22 percent of the territory where most of the Russians, but not all of them, lived where most of the resources are too, by the way. And uh, we will run essentially an economy of force mission. Our strategy is to build an impregnable fort and then let the Ukrainians expend themselves against it. And then when we're ready, uh, we'll take the offensive. And that's effectively what's happened. And the Ukrainians have expended themselves. They are now at a point where I would say there's practically nothing left. Anybody who is really trained to do much is dead or wounded. It depends on which source you want to trust, but it runs from 250,000 dead up to 300,000 dead to 350,000 dead on the Ukrainian side. And that's military force, not... Yeah, that's just, that's just soldiers. That's just soldiers. Now, I don't know how many civilians have been killed, and I'm very, very suspicious of that because despite the change in strategy that, it, that it resulted, he has always been unwilling to kill quote-unquote innocent. So if you strike something, or you see he, a... President Putin. Yeah. So if you see a strike going somewhere, as we did quite recently, the objective was to kill, frankly speaking, foreign forces that were billeted in the hotel. This included U.S., U.K., and others, because he's been warning 
everybody in NATO, get out. If you don't get out, you're going to be at risk. And then, of course, next to it, I guess, was a school or something. And uh, mm -hmm. so immediately the Ukrainians say, see, the Russians are killing people in schools. You know, we, we went through this repeatedly where the Ukrainians would set up uh, gun positions inside hospitals, schools, malls. And once that happened, the, the Russians had no choice but to destroy those gun positions, which meant that they were inevitably attacking what were formerly only civilian targets. I mean, this is not new. We've been through this in the Middle East. We, we've experienced something similar. So the bottom line is that now we're at a point where the Ukrainians really have expended virtually everything they've got. They're now talking about mounting one last counteroffensive. I don't know how they're going to do it. Whatever they do, it won't succeed. They have no chance of breaking through Russian defenses. In the meantime, I think we've had a certain amount of unrest in the senior ranks of the Russian military because a lot of the senior officers want to attack and end this war. And they're very concerned a, about... A lot of what senior officials? General officers in the, in the uh, Russian army, the senior generals. So, it's a, so then there's a misalignment between Putin and his leaders. Well, I don't know if I'd call it a misalignment as much as Putin is still reluctant to take decisive action to end the war quickly because he's concerned about our predisposition to intervene. The great fear from the beginning has always been that once it became clear that the Ukrainian position was hopeless, there would be pressure in Washington to intervene, to rescue what's left. We almost have to protect our $150 billion investment. Right? <laughs> it's, it's almost a, if you think about it, it's like, it's like hedging. If that does happen, hey, we're so in it now that we said once we're not going to send them tanks. If we do, it's going to be this. Now we're talking you know, planes and all this stuff. We almost have to defend Ukraine now. Well, I, I don't think so, but... Uh, I'm talking from the Biden's administration. Yeah, well, your argument actually uh, probably sounds more like how we got ourselves into the First World War. But the bottom line is with, with this crowd right now, they've expended enormous sums of money. So I'm sure there's pressure from BlackRock and Raytheon and others. Uh, somebody told me the other day there are only three branches of government in the United States now. One is BlackRock, one is uh, Raytheon, and the other is the pharmaceuticals. Uh, so there's some there's some tragic truth to that since the Hill is basically owned by donors and we have government by donors. The American people really don't have much of a voice and uh, they don't know much about it, so they don't say much about it. But the truth is right now the Ukrainians are, are on, the, on the ropes. There's no doubt about it. And there's this discussion, I think, behind the scenes. Do we just move now and end this thing decisively because they can? Or uh, do we wait some more and let the Ukrainians expend some more time and effort? And now you have discussions in the West about a joint Polish-Lithuanian intervention into Western Ukraine. And that's exactly the sort of thing that the Russians have been concerned about. And that could never happen without us, without us authorizing it, supporting it, and encouraging it. And Putin knows that. So we're at a kind of crossroads right now in terms of what's next, and the Russians have to make a decision. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a lot there. I'm sorry, Tom. I just, there's a lot there uh, that we covered. A few things. So from a strategist standpoint, okay, you know, the, the world, when they think about who Putin is, you know, former KGB, this guy's going to be a shrewd guy. He's going to be 15 steps ahead, or he's going to identify his next 5, 10, 15 moves. So... You're going to sit there and say, if we do this, that guy's going to do this. If we do this, are we going to push NATO to want to move quicker to support them? If we do this, maybe it's going to be easier to take over a part of Ukraine that we want under Biden, not Trump, because it's going to... I'm, I'm picturing him as a guy that sat there with his generals looking at every single possibility that could happen. How did he miss the ball on, hey, let's go soft on this. It's going to be fine. They're going to cave in. We're going to get him in no time. His military guys say, no, let's go hard. That's a big miscalculation there on his end, isn't it? Well, I think President Putin, you mentioned his KGB background. One of the things that people do not understand about the KGB is that the individuals that served in it were practically the only people in the Soviet Union that were allowed to travel beyond the borders of the Soviet Union. That meant that they could travel in the West. Putin was very familiar with the West, particularly with Germany. And by the way, he likes Germans, speaks pretty, pretty good German, because I've listened to him in his interviews. Uh, so from his standpoint, he saw a West that he thought they could work with, they could deal with. And he's always been criticized inside Russia for taking that position. 
because I would say the mainstream Russian position is you can't do business with the West. The West is our implacable enemy. That will never change. We are Russians. We are not part of Europe. We are not part of the West. I think Putin took a different position. I think he thought that Russia should be part of the larger European concert and should have a role in the West. Well, he, it turns out his critics were right and he was wrong. Now, he's still a very popular leader because he has improved the standards of living, prosperity. He's restored a lot of Russian national pride and dignity. I think his latest poll, unofficial poll that we get out of, uh, out of Russia puts him at about 89% approval, whereas Biden is at about 30%. So I think uh, Putin is very secure in that sense now, but he has always struggled with this idea of how far do I want to push it because Putin is, is a smart man. He says, when this is over, we want to live with the Europeans and we want to live with the United States. We never thought about that during the Second World War. There were some people who did because we did enormous damage to Japan, enormous damage to Germany, which is one of the reasons we had to stay there for 50 years. And there were a few voices, Admiral Leahy, who was the chief, effectively the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time for Roosevelt, brought in the generals and said, look, you're doing terrible things to these people. We want to be able to live with the Germans and the Japanese when this is over. Well, we didn't pay too much attention to that, but Putin is taking a different position. And he has also made it very clear that this is Russia. This is not the Soviet Union. And the Russian military, contrary to what the Ukrainians have been claiming, have not committed atrocities all over the place. They've not murdered and raped and pillaged. In other words, this is not Stalin's force, his slave army of 1944 and 45. Putin's made that very clear. He still wants to get along, quote unquote. He, would, he wants to avoid a direct war with the United States and with NATO. That drives much of his behavior. But as I said, now he's at a point where he's got to make some decisions. And that is, what do we do? Do we continue to move slowly and deliberately and watch as the Poles and Lithuanians, presumably backed by the United States, intervene in Western Ukraine? Is that what we do? Or do we act? Because what he doesn't want is whatever is remains of Ukraine when this is over. He wants that to be neutral. He doesn't want it to be militarized. He doesn't want it to be a platform for attack against Russia. He views Ukraine the same way we viewed Cuba in 1963. We don't want it to be a platform for attack against us. We still don't. And that's his position. Now, can he achieve that if he stands by and allows the Poles, the Lithuanians, or anybody else, even U.S. forces, to move into western Ukraine? I think the answer is no. Colonel, is the position you just described very eloquently on uh, President Putin, is that the resolved view that is in front of President Biden, is that where the Joint Chiefs are, or are they taking a different view? What I do know is that the senior officers uh, in the Army and the Pentagon, I can't speak for the other services, but certainly the Army have made it very clear that we are in no position to wage conventional war against the Russians. And they're, are they presenting what you just presented as Putin's attitude and position with that? I, I doubt it, simply because if you try to present that position to the people who are really running the government, they are so full of hatred and animosity and antipathy for Moscow and what it represents to them that no one will listen. So they're, I think they're, they're, they have what we call ideological blinders on. So is that why there is so much willingness if that is a prevailing view that's being propagated not only to the president's daily you know th threat report i assume and to the president himself then is it any surprise to you that senators are green lighting billions of dollars for ukraine because it's to defeat this evil not to not to go middle east on you but to defeat this evil satan that is the old sure. ussr russia uh, well remember part of the problem here is of putin's own making at the beginning because of the way he went in it conveyed to the West, this notion that, see, the Russians aren't serious, they're weak. They're weak. They don't know what they're doing. And then we flooded the airways with all of this propaganda about the Russians are stupid, and they described the Russians exactly the way the Germans described the Soviets during World War II, which, of course, was nonsense. I mean, I, I was in graduate school in Soviet East European studies, so I'm very familiar with it. And they literally lifted phrases and things out of books that had been written about the Soviet army in the end of the Second World War, and they were hurling this crap at the Russians. 
And, and everybody in the West, of course, was eager to believe it. Remember, we have the Cold War behind us. So it's not very hard to say, you know, the Russians are really bad. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. They, they were bad a few years ago, so they must be bad again. Uh, that, that's part of the problem. But Putin went in. He was, he was too easy, and it looked as though he was weak. Well, now everything is turned around. You're, you've got about 750,000 troops focused on the Western uh, military district in Russia, in other words, the th Western theater, about 350,000 in the south. Now, where are the other 400,000? Well, some of them are tied up in logistical support infrastructure. Some of them are in missile, uh, rocket, artillery batteries. Some of them are up in Belarusia. Some of them are just in Western Russia. The, the point is that this is an enormously powerful force now with all the most modern equipment and technology. I think even the, the biggest skeptics are shocked and surprised at the precision, the accuracy, and the responsiveness of Russian missile and strike assets. For people who are listening who don't have a map in front of them, when you say the Western theater of Russia, you mean the Eastern also border of Ukraine right there, and yes. the South you mean Crimea. I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about in Southern Ukraine, the area which is referred to by the Russians as Novorussia. This, is, this stretches from basically Odessa all the way up to Kharkov. Most of that is now under Russian control. With this force of three yeah. quarters of a million. Yes. So okay, so let's go. Let's go back to uh, thinking, trying to think what Putin was thinking about. So let's go soft instead of going hard. What, what's what's the advantages of going soft? So for you as a strategist, to be fair, I mean, you, you know, when you're saying, you know, how you would do it and what you would do, you have a PhD, I think, in international uh, uh, relations. Uh, relations from University of Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. So. If, if what is the advantage of going soft? Are you going soft because you're thinking that guy's going to cave? Okay, fine. So let's flip it. What is the advantage of going hard right off the bat where his soldiers are saying, no, uh, we have to go strong with these guys to get what done? What's their argument of going hard instead of going soft? Well, first, let's be clear about the PhDs and degrees. You know, thermometers have degrees, and you know where you stick those. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging my PhD. I'm just being honest. There are a lot of people walking around with degrees that, that don't know anything. In fact, I would argue that most of them don't amount to anything. They don't produce anything. They're not practitioners. I focused when I went to graduate school on military matters because I'm a professional soldier. And it was my obligation, I thought, since the American people were funding my education, to focus on military affairs and specifically at that point on the Soviet Union and to a lesser extent East Germany and Poland and Czechoslovakia. Those are those the areas where I focused. Now, having said that, again, it goes back to a set of assumptions. I think that Putin, if you go back and look at his willingness to negotiate, there was a point during the first three weeks when the negotiators met that Putin uh, said, I will immediately embrace a ceasefire while these negotiations are on. And uh, they stopped. The Russians stopped in their tracks. Of course, people in the West said, well, that's because they're logistically unsustainable and all this. But that wasn't true. He was sending a signal. I'm serious. I'm willing to negotiate. And remember that the whole thing revolved around the Minsk Accords. Nobody in the West pays much attention to those accords, but they were signed by Germany, France. We backed them. And we promised that the Russians who live in Ukraine would be treated as equal citizens, equal before the law along with Ukrainians. They would not be pressured to become Ukrainian as long as they were good citizens and obeyed the law. They could speak their own language, go to their own schools, go to their own church, and so forth. That was a big lie, as it turns out. And Angela Merkel, who was the German chancellor, was the first to come out publicly and say we lied. That was just to buy time for Ukraine to build itself up into the military power that it has become. Subsequently, Macron admitted it was a lie. So even after having been lied to prolifically about all the things that were important to the Russians, uh, he decided, I'll call a ceasefire, we'll see how these... Uh, uh, talks progress. Well, the talks didn't progress. And then suddenly we had this man, Boris Johnson, who flew in as, as effectively a surrogate for Biden and said, stop, don't give up anything. And that was because Zelensky had said, sure, I think we could live with neutrality. Actually made that statement, which was the end goal as far as Putin was concerned. We wanted to be neutral. In other words, you have this nice, large, neutral state the size of Texas that lies between Russia and NATO. Gosh, 
That's a good thing. Mm-hmm. In fact, back in uh, 1999 and, and 1998, when I was the director of the Joint Operations Center at SHAPE Headquarters, Supreme uh, Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, these discussions went on, and somebody said, well, what's Ukra- where's Ukraine in all of this? And everybody said, Ukraine's mission is to be a nice buffer. You know, don't, don't fight there, don't go there, let them be a nice buffer between Russia and us. I mean, that was widely viewed as a positive thing. Well... That was thrown out of the window. And instead, Boris Johnson says, we will back you to the hilt. We will give you everything that we possibly can. Your job is to go out there and fight, and we'll back you, and eventually we will be victorious. The Russians will collapse. Putin will be gone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of that's happened. Happy 4th of July, too. We have a special event that's coming up with Tom Brady, Mike Tyson, and Will Gidera in Miami, Vault Conference. It'll be August 30th to September 2nd. This weekend for 4th of July, we're running a special. Buy one, get one free. Bring your spouse, bring your business partner, bring your running mate. If you haven't yet registered, click on a link below or above. Get registered. Looking forward to spending three days with you in Miami.